Personal vlog, September the 25th, 2018. We've got the petition up and running. We've got a lot of people signing up. My YouTube channel seems to be doing phenomenally well. It, it even surpasses any expectations I ever had on it. We've built a social media empire, I guess. Uh, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got YouTube, but it's, it's the YouTube that seems to have taken off the most. And, the, you know, it, I have to stop sometime, sit back and reflect a little bit. And I thought it would be better, people would be interested to hear the personal story behind it as well. I am taking on an entire world of the flavour of orthodontics. I'm trying to, you know, I'm just, I'm taking on the whole world here, and it's largely just me. And I have, I, I cannot believe myself the sort of personal sacrifices that I've made to be at this point. I started this mission. Well, I was 14 when I started to decided to become a dentist and relatively soon afterwards I thought I would want to go on and do orthodontics. It was just my father's passion was infectious. I, you know, as young as I could learn to speak, I was talking to my father about these ideas and concepts. He would sit at home at the kitchen, didn't matter if he had an office, it didn't matter if he had a desk somewhere, but he would always spread himself out on the kitchen table, doing a project, doing a something, and I would listen in and watch, what are you doing, Dad? And it was infectious. I qualified as a dentist in 93 at the Royal London Hospital, and I was, I, I, I overwent by more than 12 months, something in the region of 16, 18 months. And it was, I, I it was never the best student. I was never the academic. I, I'm never going to think in parallel lines. I'm never going to think as you, 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 the machinery wants to turn someone out. It was not how I thought or how I did things. And also I had a great time at university. I really did. I, I had a lot of fun and built my ability of personal communication up so that I, I, I could communicate well with people. I think that's uh, it's, it's a very important thing. I then realized I was not going to be a general dentist. I didn't really follow a nice pathway to make your career. I locumed here or there, and I locumed in Pentonville Prison, I locumed on the locum in Stornoway, the Outer Hebrides. I then went around the world and worked in um, South Africa, so I worked in, I worked for Wits University. I turned up offering to work for free and they insisted on paying me because I, <clears throat> I, I guess they liked me and they thought I was valuable. And I would, part of that was going out into Baragwanath Hospital in Soweto and we're looking at some surgical cases. And I, it was crazy with the things we, they were doing. Then I went to Australia and I worked up in the Northern Territories and I had to go out in some of the Aboriginal communities. I bought a motorbike, drove it around, well, down the middle and right up round to Sydney, which is just mind blowing distance. And then came back, got a surgical position at Eastbourne and Brighton, which is a normal prelude to go into the orthodontic pathway. I, I then struggled with a sort of the volumes of um, material they wanted you to learn. I went to Denmark instead. I didn't, I, you know, Britain, British orthodontic schools are very, very academic rather than practical where the Danish universities were very practical rather than academic, and also they were taking foreign students. Aarhus, where I went to, is, well, it's considered probably, certainly within the top five programmes in the world, probably one of the top three um, in the world. So it, it was a good choice to go to. It was a hard programme because from the, they filled you up. All of these top programmes fill you up every 
five minutes of your day is full and then still some, still they want more time. But in Denmark, it was very much the focus on the practical of, 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 get, of this tooth being this twisted, this plan, what you're thinking about that item, how you're going forward with this event. It was a, a real focus on the, the actual clinical outcomes where it, it seemed, in my opinion, that the British universities were a lot more theory-based. You had to learn massive volumes of information and then repeat this back to demonstrate you've learnt this information. Well, in my view, you've got Google. Also, high street orthodontics in Denmark is supposed to be some of the best in the world. Britain I, doesn't have that reputation. Um, and then qualified, I came back to the UK. I started doing orthotropics here at the London School of Facial Orthotropics one day a week with my father, as I had done for many years before I went back to, off to university. And I then four fell hell out of heels in love, married this Turkish girl. It was a disaster. In many ways, I, I never would have come on to do what I want, I'm doing now, because you can't have a unhappy marriage and spend all this time and dedication and focus to achieve something, especially a non-entity, an unknown. Then, at the same time as I got together with Miller, Ludmilla, my wife now, mother of my children, I then thought to myself, I've got two choices. Well, either I go on be a conventional orthodontist, accept conventional orthodontic wisdom, make some money, enjoy my life in other ways, or I focus on orthotropics, and if I'm going to focus on orthotropics, I'm going to really have to bite the bullet and go for it whole hog. And I coincidentally found someone I really liked, who was very happy to move to the suburbs and live a five minute walk away from my clinic, and allow me to throw ridiculous hours and my future on, on a whim, on, on a passion. And you know, I, I'd, I'd studied orthodontics. I'd gone for a three-year program in Denmark. I had major surgery, so here was another course. It took me longer to do. It took me another six months to do. But I had Crohn's disease, and I had a, I was disemboweled, and they did surgery. And it's, it's, it's a very scary thing that, you know, you're on your own in a different country um, to go into surgery and have that done. But oh, we got it done. But I'd done this entire program. I'd gone to Denmark. I'd studied orthodontics all the time, thinking in my head, well, actually, I've, I've got real big questions and concerns about what I'm being taught. And when I was at university, I asked many questions of the lecturers, and I, I wasn't happy with the answers. I, I, I could have spun the conversation. I could have gone a long way and even made them look stupid. But what's the point? I mean, I'm not here for that. I was here to learn from them, not try and throw my ideas down their throats. But I actually went for a course to study it, to get the bit of paper, not actually to be an orthodontist. And then that kind of swayed my opinion. So when I finished my relationship, the dust had settled and then I'd met Miller. I'm thinking, right, well, I should now go and do what I always wanted to do, the whole purpose of going back to university to become an orthodontist, to get the piece of paper so no one could claim that I wasn't an orthodontist. I was able to get massive information and knowledge. Aarhus, where I went to in Denmark, had some of the groundbreaking work on growth and development. You know, Bjork had been there. Um, was the professor, and his ideas and concepts, were, you know, are the bedrock of a lot of understanding about how faces grow. So it was a good education, but I always did that education with the full knowledge that I would probably never use much of it. And it's a hard thing to do to spend three or more years of that level of hard work for the sake of getting a bit of paper, not the knowledge. So in, I guess, what was it, 2011, 2012, I moved down beside the clinic here. The clinic was working one day a week, 
we were, I mean, we weren't losing money, but we had a very minimalistic clinic that was on a Thursday. We were getting some nice results, about a third of the patients. I, I think probably shouldn't have bothered coming to us because they didn't make an effort to change. A third of the patients, I had nice results. And a third of the patients were outstanding. I mean, those, when I look around at other facial results, they were from other people, we were way ahead. I mean, I once got a one colleague, or I've got a couple of colleagues over my lifetime, but this one colleague was was, was a well-respected, well-qualified, um, he was doing good work, and he showed me his best, 10 best results that he'd ever achieved. And they, they didn't compare to our results at all. I mean, there was no comparison. So I knew we, we, we were getting something, and I could see this with the facial results. I, I knew the base science. I'd, I'd been in Denmark, and I knew it didn't fulfill the, the answers I had. And of course, I was deeply worried. It was actually, it was 97, just before, 96, 97, when my father wanted to. Um, or maybe 98, when he was thinking of sort of taking a lot, lo borrowing a lot of money to make a, a film to say what he was thinking, to get his ideas out there. And I thought, I, you know, I, I, he was getting more and more frustrated. I thought, you know, I need to do something to gain my father the recognition he deserves and, and follow my passion and, and do what's right and do what the evidence says and continue to get these great results because, you know, we weren't making much money of any money. It was effectively a charity we were running. But we were making people better. And you can't describe the amount of ways people are better. You, you, you see this. <clears throat> I mean, the, the images I show I grossly underestimate the actual change you have in a person when you make them better. And of course, I'd made a few people worse in my time. Or, you know, I worked in a big factory orthodontic practice in East Grinstead. And I, I didn't see the patients every time. They were seen by different orthodontists. But you, you, you see them when they started, and then you might, might meet them once or twice through the treatment. I didn't treatment plan these patients. I was a functionary. I was a little cog within the wheel. And I, I really wasn't happy with the, the outcomes of what we were doing with people. So <clears throat> I was then unhappy where I was concerned about my father, where, you know, his recognition, his just people being so rude to him, just unnecessarily, and him being such a gentleman. So, you know, even even behind the scenes. You know, he wasn't bitching about people, he wasn't big and people were just so so rude to him. You know, I remember um, in, in the Brighton conference, um, a professor or a doctor in, in Michigan, no, near um, Ann Arbor, a Bowman, Jay Bowman. I remember Jay Bowman putting a picture of our family house on a presentation and just ridiculing my father to, you know, raucous laughter in the whole auditorium. And my father is sitting at the very front row. I mean, no one was sitting in the first five rows. And there's my father in the very front row, right in front of Jay Bowman as he makes his presentation and goes up afterwards, shakes his hand and says, look, I think we should talk sometime. I, I wonder what Jay Bowman would have thought. I mean, he'd have been utterly rude about my father. And my father comes up as a complete gentleman and shakes him by the hand and says, we would love to talk about these things. And because he's never had a, a level conversation with an orthodontist ever, no. I mean, I have a few sound bites once in a while. But, you know, when someone starts insulting your father, that gets you going as well, another factor in the fray. So, I think I should do something. In uh, 2009, I wrote the article, um, A Black Swan. I'm aware, I mean, Black Swan, I was talking about a Black Swan event, a very unusual event, but um, a, a very unusual, a, a very unusual occurrence, you know, how you can think you've got it sewn up, you think you can understand things. 
Do you, no, I use Black Swan because I'd been reading up on Karl Popper on the philosophy of science. And Karl Popper was saying how it's very difficult to ever prove anything. You can't <clears throat> prove that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. It probably will, and the mass of the earth and the sun and the <clears throat> dynamics are so large that almost certainly the sun will come up tomorrow. But Karl Popper uses a good analogy. And he says that, could you prove the swans were white? And of course, you can more or less prove that swans are white because every swan in existence, almost, that you find is white. Interestingly, in Perth, Australia, you've got black swans. Just in Perth. So if you'd never been to Perth, Australia, and you'd looked at every other swan on the entire planet, you would have concluded that swans were black. I'm oh, sorry, swans were white. Then you go to Perth and you completely confound, you completely demonstrate that you're wrong. So you can't prove these things. You can only ever disprove things. And clearly within orthodontics, people have been throwing the concept at me all the time. Prove it, prove it, prove it. And I'm, well, you, you, what proof do you want? I mean, I can show you lots of cases where we've got fantastic changes in facial form. I can promise you that our rate of gaining these fashionistic changes is way better than your clinics. You know, I've been into th probably approaching hundreds of clinics. I've been to lots of universities and I really take an eye. I will always ask to see the before photographs and look at the before photographs, look at the current photographs. And, you know, I just don't see people getting great results. They will get the odd person because you're going to get the odd individual who does a, um, <clears throat> oh, was it with Katie, um, Catherine Zeta Jones, yeah. So they'll do, do it as Zeta Jones, basically. You know, she had four premolars taken out, but she just, her tongue went right up on the roof of her mouth. And she said, that's why I want my tongue. That's why I'm gonna keep it. And whereas they did the orthodontics, it, her face probably got better even because she personally was determined to hold her tongue there. That was her response. And she got a great facial change, I'm sure, during the orthodontics, or she had a great face to begin with. And a lot of, well, not a lot, you, there will always be an element of teenagers who decide around puberty that you know, the opposite sex exists. I look stupid hanging my mouth open with poor body posture. I better improve myself. So they make improvements. That gets improvements in facial form. And if you happen to be treating that individual with a method that isn't too damaging, they will gain a facial improvement. And so you'll always have a random sample of improvements. And so I see lots of nice cases. I see lots of people showing good facial changes. I don't think the facial changes compare with our best facial changes. <clears throat> They're more on the level of our average to poor facial changes. But we're getting that type of result in almost everyone across the board, whereas it seems to be a couple of cases for <clears throat> most of the other clinics. And of course, I, I think that they think <clears throat> that we just treat a lot of patients. And when we get an occasional case that goes well, we make a song and dance about it. It's a shame we don't have an open dialogue. It's a shame there's not this communication that we can engage in. <clears throat> so the, the purpose of the Black Swan editorial, so I went to the British Dental Association and I met with Stephen Hancock, who is excellent. He really has shown a real unbiased hand. He's given me airtime on the British Dental Journal and he's given the orthodontist airtime on the British Dental Journal. And I think he's been very fair. So I met with him <clears throat> and then I wrote my first proper article. You know, I actually, here's me writing my words 
down me a, a dyslexic fool who, who can't write but two sentences together. And I wrote down a editorial called The Black Swan that was published in the British Dental Journal in 1997. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that you can't prove anything, you can only disprove things. And I <clears throat> asked the orthodontic community to try and disprove what I was saying. But also I challenged them to a debate on why teeth are crooked, saying that, you know, we're, we're treating all these patients, we need to understand why the teeth are crooked. It makes sense to me that that would be one of the main things we should do. I then <clears throat> carried on with a letter writing campaign that went on for about five years. It was about full on for five years. I wrote to everyone saying, come on, we, you know, the, and the Minister of Health, the All Party Dental Committee, the, I got, I happened to have my next door neighbour was <clears throat> a Lord. Yeah, well, it was London home was there. Well, he had the next two homes he'd converted in this beautiful little muse we lived in. <clears throat> and I, he was kind enough to ask some questions. I think he then went completely cold and stopped answering my mails, which is what I often find. <clears throat> some orthodontist or some professional will have a word in their ear and that, that's what happens. That's suppression. That's how it goes on. You get blackballed. Anyway, he answered a question in the House of Lords. I uh, talked to the all-party, as I said, all-party dental committee. <clears throat> the... Um, General Dental Council, the, the group above, the, the, the quango above the General Dental Council, the um, healthcare regulatory excellence or something. Um, the Royal Society, the I, everyone I wrote letters to, and of course the British Orthodontic Society, a lot, saying we need to have a debate. Um, it, it gained me nowhere. At this point, <clears throat> I'm trying to expand my clinic. I... Basically, I've sold my house I, a little while ago. I, I still had some money in the bank. I burnt it all, keeping the clinic alive. I got on, um, Kian came along, and Kian was very useful initially and really gained us. The, the, I'd already identified that we needed to get out on social media. Social media was just developing at the time. And we he basically set up a sweatshop. At the time, there were lots of non-UK people coming into the country, and a good avenue for them to do was studies as dental nurses, and you had dentists studying as dental nurses, and we had quite a few of them working here in the clinic, and particularly Abid, who's turned out to be a gem, and we, we just pumped social media. We run a little sweatshop where we just pumped stuff out and we got our name out there we got our brand out there we got the concepts out there and of course <clears throat> one of the things that Kian and several other people said to me was <clears throat> this thing YouTube it's taking off what you need to do is you need to do a video on a, a hundred a thousand videos so a, a video on it lots of different subjects so what's an overjet what's an overbite what these things so we started making these YouTube videos we put these YouTube videos out there and of course, I was itching to say something what I really thought, you know, actually say something interesting that, you know, I was believing that I, I, this is what I want to do. I want to get this information out there. I'd... <clears throat> and so we start putting more um, interesting information out. And it, it seems to, to I, hadn't, I didn't notice to begin with. I don't really notice this seemed to be taking off till where are we, in 2008, I think three, four years ago, I really suddenly noticed that YouTube seems to be going some. <clears throat> um, um, I think it was, we, we had a, so, someone wrote to me saying, can they volunteer to help in the clinic? They'd come for a consultation. He had not been enjoying university and then dropped out of university. He was reading an article or a book, something that, to do with your life. And one of the things they suggested was you should go and volunteer for someone who's going somewhere. So he thought, I'll volunteer to go and work with Mike Mew. He came here two, three times a week initially. And I said to him, right, well, what do you want to do? I tried to set him up doing a 
a, a, a sort of website that we were trying to run to bring in lots of professionals as sort of um, to bring interest to professionals from lots of different other specialities because I thought that was needed but he, he didn't really get behind that but he did get behind the videos he really enjoyed doing the videos and we started making videos with him and I now started saying what I really thought and he was posting them and he um no, he did well he did and interestingly he he was with us when we surpassed 10,000 hits on YouTube or 10,000 friends like some um, followers followers yeah I think so on uh, YouTube and when we had 10,000 Google writes you a letter and they were supposed to send us a button don't know whatever happened to that a silly button thing but we then got access to the Google Plex in um, uh, North London and he went up there a couple of times met a few people and entered a competition to get a place on some fully paid for program that Google was done in Naples and he got a place and he got a place I believe largely on the work he did with us so fact he, he followed some sound advice that paid off for him and we helped him out but he clearly helped me out and we got all these videos out there and of course as far as YouTube goes the rest is history till this point because now it's, it's YouTube's going through the roof I mean uh, we've had a couple of blips but the blip we're having at the moment we've, we've jumped by 10 times the number of views going on and in a way I, I've, I've been keeping everything back because clearly I couldn't tell the world of orthodontics that I was going to make a petition to government in advance because they would have sought possibly to limit the impact of what I was going to do and I, that wouldn't have helped me so we have had to keep a little bit back and <clears throat> in a way I'm not going to release this video for a week or so so of the information I'll say today So, where are we today? Well, today, I've, I've gone a long way. I've pushed on every angle as hard and fast as I can. I didn't get the debate with the General Dental Council that I was hoping to get. That was my objective with my letter writing campaign. I've now built this large social media empire and I thought, well, we should go to the people. We should go to the people. I met someone who was very capable and very passionate as well, Claire. And Claire has come on board with me. She, Well, Claire was wanting to do something and we chatted and she said, well, OK, I like your petition idea. I don't like the idea of you trying to make the General Dental Council hold a petition on the etiology of malocclusion, what the cause of crooked teeth, who cares about these things. What we need to do is change this focus onto the benefits of good facial growth for young kids. And of course, I had prevention already in my head. So we came together on this and <clears throat> she is now managing this petition to um, government. Well, we're actually doing a, a change.org petition because then we can get all, the whole world, not just British people involved. But the idea is to gain change in Britain because it is the perfect place to gain change. <clears throat> Here, the government pays for orthodontics. It also plays for sleep apnea and all its consequences. So for them, the possibility of preventing all of these costs is huge. <clears throat> because our, our healthcare, like every other healthcare system in the world, is screaming from lack of money, we already have in system, you know, groups and... Um, uh, committees that will look at the science behind things to say where they're going to invest their money, where money should go based on the evidence. So as soon as I can access that, as soon as I'm not suppressed, I can actually have a level playing field to explain myself, then we'll get change. And we need to get the petition to get to the point where I'm going to get that change. So I've made, at this point, a lot of YouTube videos to interest people, and clearly I want some of them to go viral to get the information out of them. And they're being effective, and because they're being effective, they gain the attention of the 
orthodontists around the world. I would imagine that there was patients going to their orthodontist and asking difficult questions in every country all around the planet because of my YouTube channel. And I would imagine in <clears throat> a lot of the English speaking countries, this has become a huge issue. And I imagine then that a lot of these orthodontists have complained amongst themselves and that message has reached the British Orthodontic Society in the UK. So I get a letter from the British Orthodontic Society in the UK about a year ago now. In fact, I think it was the, was it the 27th of September 2017. Um, so the British Orthodontic Society wrote to me saying they didn't like a video, uh, one particular video, one with Stephen Lynn and me, and we talk about, it was me, Dad and Stephen Lynn talking about, we're chewing the fat really about orthodontics and things. And the British Orthodontist Society told me that I am, what I'm saying in this video is incorrect. It's not, you know, it breaks the rules of the British Orthodontic Society. This is only a club after all, so they want to throw me out the club. So. I then start asking them, okay, well, what exactly did I say that you didn't like? And they're saying, look, you've, you've just got to take the videos down or we're going to throw you out. And I go, well, actually, I'd like you to tell me what I said. And by the way, I've been trying to get you into a debate on the etiology of malocclusion for years. And I'm really concerned that orthodontics can, in some situations, on some people, cause a downswing in facial growth that can exacerbate sleep apnea. I didn't hear anything. Um, they then report me to the General Dental Council. So now I've got the British Orthodontic Society, who don't want to debate with me on why teeth are crooked, going through my videos, finding things they don't like, and reporting me to the General Dental Council. Of course, when I get the letter from the General Dental Council saying you have been reported by the British Orthodontic Society, I phone my insurance company up. And of course, my insurance now kicks in, which is very lucky for me because now I've had the backing of a top team, a top legal team, a fantastic legal team who have given me very sound, good advice. And they say to me, OK, well, we spy that your incident with the General Dental Council is going to affect. Sorry, wrong way around. So my legal team spy that my conflict or my issue with the British Orthodontic Society could affect the outcome of the hearing with the General Dental Council. So they say, we're going to give you legal advice covered by my insurance. So it's not free, but in fact, they're giving it to me for the British Orthodontic Society, which was fantastic. And I thank you to the um, Dental Protection Dental Protection, you have really helped me out with this. And they gained a legal team, I'm saying Hempson's have helped me, fantastic. Um, Chris Morris has really been, you know, cool, logical, sound advice. And, you know, it's good to have a sounding board when you're thinking about something. I'm sure he finds me incredibly frustrating. I mean, as he says, 99.9% .9 of the time he's trying to keep people out of trouble. And here's me trying to run straight into trouble. I mean, Liz, you couldn't make this all up if you tried it. <laughs> it seems crazy. So, and one of the interesting things we found about the British Orthodontic Society is, of course, it's a charity. They became a charity, I think, for financial reasons. But in becoming a charity, they had to fill out the paperwork. And when they filled the paperwork out, it was asking, who is your benefactor? because you have to have oh, sorry, beneficiaries. Who's your ben who is your beneficiary? And they fill out on the form that their beneficiaries are the current and future patients. Now, that seemed very sensible, but I think that's going to be their downfall now, because I'm basically saying that they're not acting in the interests of their beneficiaries. So they're in breach of the rules of a charity. And 
they should do what I'm asking them to do because that's what their beneficiaries would want them to do. And of course, they're angry at all this information I'm putting up. In a way, I'm putting this information up to gain interest, but I'm also putting this information up because it is the truth and it's helping people. And it clearly is helping a lot of people but they want to close it down. And I can understand they want to close it down. I'm, I'm, my truth is different from their truth. But my concern is that I'm open to debate and discussion, and they've not been open to debate and discussion. So in that fact, they're wrong. And I know their beneficiaries would want them to engage in open debate. They've been, without a question, their beneficiaries would want them to engage in a debate on why teeth are crooked without question. So, the, my legal team then writes to the British Orthodontic Society and they say, okay, we're becoming involved now. You need to give Dr. Mew specific allegations. You can't just say, oh, well, we didn't like your video. You've got to take it down or stop becoming a member of the British Orthodontic Society. So Chris writes a letter to them and they say, okay, wait a second, we're gonna get someone to look at the videos and come up with a, a, a list of allegations. Now I think, so they got someone called Alison Murray to make a list of allegations against me. Clearly that was her task. And I, I, I have a feeling she looked at these videos and she said, you know, that, there's not much in that Stephen Lynn video, not really to get him. So she had a hunt through our videos. In my view, I think she did a bit of a hatchet job, and I think anyone really reading the allegations she'd made would they were slightly on weak ground, but she's clearly hunted through the videos, probably taking advice from, I suspect, from a couple of other people, and come up with a list of allegations and then presented at me with that list of allegations. But of course, all those allegations are on the fine detail. And what I've gone back clearly and consistently to the British Orthodontic Society to say is, look, I cannot get involved in a discussion on these allegations unless we first nail down a debate on the etiology and in re preferably have a debate on or nail down the pathology because if you have a significant influence by the environment if the environment if the environment has a significant influence on malocclusion and what else and if it has a significant influence on malocclusion then there must be a pathological process through which that influence occurs it, it has to and of course nearly everything I'm saying on YouTube or my comments relate to the pathological process. So to defend the allegations, I'm gonna to have to discuss the etiology, then I'm gonna to have to discuss the pathological process and we have to nail them down, otherwise we're speaking different languages. And I cannot be judged by a committee who believes malocclusion is due to the genes, genetic, when I believe, and it would appear that the truth is, that it's due to the environment, or predominantly due to the environment. How, how can you judge me if, if, you, if you, you hold the wrong viewpoint, an incorrect and unscientifically based viewpoint? We also suggest that we should have the um, disciplinary meeting that they want to have out in the open so that we have an open meeting because I think a lot of people would benefit from this. What I'm concerned about going is into this private meeting with the British Orthodontic Society where I then, well, they can make, they can make up their own mind. They're, 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 they're a private club. Well, they're actually charity, but they, they, they wrote the rules so they can actually do what they want to do and they can throw me out. It's not the end of the world. But it does damage my reputation. And of course, I think I've done nothing wrong. So why should I be thrown out of a club for actually trying to do the right thing and trying to push science forwards? And of course, I can be very stubborn at times. I'm not going to have someone push me around for doing the right thing when they're doing the wrong thing, whatever the score is. 
<clears throat> clearly my legal team just keep telling me to resign. They said, just resign, get out of it. Then they can't make a decision on you. You're scot-free. But any decision they make, <clears throat> you know they're going to refer you to the General Dental Council. And if you give your argument on all of these points, you know that the General Dental Council is going to be ready for your argument because they will have heard it already before I turn up. So, I am in a very difficult situation, but I am going to this meeting with the British Orthodontic Society tomorrow. I would have liked to take my father. I would have liked to take a member of the Patients Association. I would have liked to take a journalist. I would have liked to take just a senior, respected member of medicine. I'd have liked to just, you know, have anyone accompanying me for this meeting, but they're not going to have that. I would have liked to take an audio recording of the meeting because I, I just don't trust them, really. I mean, not, you know, they've sent me a letter saying, <clears throat> we had a meeting. We decided to expel Dr. Mew. Then we took legal advice and realised we can't expel him. We're going to have to have give him the opportunity to come in for a meeting first, to, to you know give him the opportunity to explain himself. But it, when someone sends you a letter saying that, you kind of think they've decided that you're guilty already. Why am I bother turning up? Well, <clears throat> I've got to turn up because I want to say face to face to the British Orthodontic Society Committee. Listen, you've got to change. My defence is going to be, I will read out a written statement and I'll make that statement available. I'll make also the allegations available. I think, you know, it, it, the allegations themselves are <clears throat> interesting and they're worth looking at. And of course, you know, they, they relate to, it's not about who said what, who, what went on, which is normally the case when you get referred to the General Dental Council. These are about my videos. This is public information. Anyone can go and look at these videos at any time. There's no ambiguity about what I say. It's up there. It's open to the public. <clears throat> so at this meeting tomorrow, I will just read a statement. And the statement will say that thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. You know, I've really wanted to have the chance to present for you for, for, for a decade, basically. And I think it's, it is a shame we've got this, 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 this gap between. I mean, there, there's so many different groups within orthodontics. I mean, you have the main body of orthodontics and you've got lots and lots and lots of splinter groups. And the main group don't talk to any of the splinter groups. It's not just orthotropics they, they want to crush. They're trying to crush <clears throat> hundreds of splinter groups. I mean, it, it's, it's criminal. You know, every other month I hear of someone, an pract orthodontic practitioner or a dentist in some country, who is being, is having his career destroyed, his life destroyed, because what he is doing is not fitting in with what conventional orthodontics in his area believe in. And what's interesting, the most crazy thing is, of course, there's change between all these groups. So you could have someone in Canada doing something that the um, Australians believe in, the main committee of Australians believe in, but he's being got at because he, the Canadians don't agree with that, and vice versa with someone in Australia. It, 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 it's, it's, it's like a witch hunt. It's like a witch hunt. It's like some religious event going on. You, know, we, you don't believe our version or our wording, so you must be thrown out. And clearly, thrown out is has big complications on people's lives when you stop them practicing, stop them earning their income. And that is what people want to do to me. <clears throat> they want to destroy me. And they want to, if they remove my license to practice, they know that orthotropics, this whole movement, I will, it will probably survive, but it will put us back a decade easily put us back a decade. And of course, I've, I've spent everything. I've, I've sold my house. Luckily, my mother was from a relatively wealthy background. I, I've blown <laughs> all the inheritance. And, you know, you know, it makes me, I've got, I've got the clinic to show for it. I live in rented accommodation, but I've got the process. I've got this, this, this network to show for it, but I'm very little to show for it. <clears throat> But there's got to be money in making faces more beautiful and people healthier. <clears throat> there's got to be somewhere. I don't know how I'm going to make this. I've got some ideas, but I, I hope, but not if I get struck off. If I get struck off, it's me and my kids on the street. It, it, it's crazy.
Anyway, I go to this meeting tomorrow. I will read out a statement, but I just, I, I've got to, it's going to be me in a room against what, 10, 12 committee meeting members? All of them hate me. All of them think I'm an utter charlatan who's abusing patients. I, I don't quite know why they think that. They've, I think this is this dialogue that they've reached within their heads because of years ago with my father, you know. I mean, they started with a very good relationship as my father sort of headed off and he tried to take people with him. But as the further and further away he became, the more they wanted to distance themselves. Then the more he tried to gain their engagement, the further they distanced themselves. And then as he starts reading the implications of what's going on, he tries harder and harder. They try harder and harder. And now, you know, it's easy for people in the establishment who think they're doing the right thing to view the actions of my father as being reprehensible, being terrible, but they don't know the full story and they don't understand the full implications. And there's just no dialogue, there's no conversation between us. I know the orthodontists think that we make an absolute fortune for doing next to nothing for patients, for messing patients up with nonsense. And but my father has a castle that is built. They think that this is built, being built on for the funds of patients. They have no idea that we live this um, literally penniless life. I cannot live on less money. <laughs> it would be very difficult to live on much less. We really, uh, we live like monks almost. You know, years I've gone without holidays, all the rest of it. Um, I work but, um, phenomenal hours trying to get this process forwards. So at tomorrow's meeting, I read a statement. I will not aim to engage in a conversation on most of the allegations because most of them require a debate on the etiology and I presume the pathology first. I will also point out that they need to engage in this debate on the etiology and the pathology because it's my defence. Then they need to do this because, well, they're a scientific organisation and they should be moving, uh, following the scientific process. And that is the scientific process. It's no good them standing there saying I'm wrong, they're right, unless they engage with me and we discuss this. Because if you don't discuss it, what's happening? Then they need to do this because I believe that their beneficiaries, the patients, would want them to do this. So they're duty bound to do that, or they're breaking their rules as a charity. Then I think because when we're considering the possibility of prevention, the possibility we could prevent if we knew, because medicine's about treating the causes of the problem. So we all understand the cause of the problem, then we could look towards prevention. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go into a debate on the details of the allegations, most of the allegations. I'll point out one of the allegations is it's, mis it's a misquote. So there's, there's no point going into that allegation. They need to review their allegation, give it back to me if they want, or forget it. And one allegation is it, purely my personal opinion. I mean, I'm entitled to my personal opinion. I can say it. There, there's nothing wrong with that. Then there's an allegation, two allegations involving patients, you know, patients' care. And I'm sorry, I cannot defend myself because I would require to breach confidentiality. I'm not going to breach confidentiality. And I think that the allegations just a little bit silly. You know, I mean, go and look at the allegations. But it's going to be a very scary thing to go into this room tomorrow and really put my beliefs you know, risk my life on my belief, my life, my life, you know, my career, everything I'm risking for my beliefs. I sometimes wonder why I'm doing this. You know, I've blown everything. <clears throat> this decade, the decade from 40 to 50, when you're supposed to be earning the most, you're supposed to be in the, the, the prime of your career. I've lived on hot air. I have blown Ooh, third of a million or more pounds of cash, you know, money I had that I've just blown. Um, 
I've worked phenomenally hard. I've had it. It was a year I, I didn't have. I didn't have a proper holiday. We had a few days off here on there. Uh, several years I've not done much. Um, I've loaded it all on, and we started the campaign and the debate. <clears throat> what ten days ago, I put a letter out on the British Dental Journal at that time. So I've now condemned myself. I've I've got to go forward with this process, and now I go into the British Orthodontic Society tomorrow, and. Whoa, dear me, this is, this is scary. You know, yes, I, I believe in what I'm doing. Yes, I've got a passion for doing this. Yes, all of that, but it is still scary. It just, uh, you know, it's gonna be very hard. I've got to be these, these austere senior people. They, the, 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 the top of their game are gonna stand there and say, well, what are you doing? You're bringing the profession into disrepute. You're, you know, you're you, 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 you. And I've got to say there and I'll say, well, actually, I think you and your entire organization and all the orthodontists on the planet are, are wrong. Oh, what are they gonna say? Then I go, no, no, you're wrong. I say, no, you're wrong. What I can't do is say anything in that event that will be used against me later. That's what why my lawyers are worried about. Because clearly this is this whole allegation, this list of allegations has been sent to the General Dental Council. And the General Dental Council, they have the power to, to, to destroy me, completely destroy me. I mean, I, I could limp on with the YouTube channel. I would limp on with the YouTube channel. I will gain change even if they strike me off. Even if this all goes wrong, I will get the end goal done. And I will gain my father recognition he deserves. And I will get the best treatment up there for patients. Why I've gone so passionate about this, I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know. Why have I thrown everything at this? That's what you do when you become passionate about something. You know, we tell kids to find their passion. I have found my passion, and it is to make people better. I hope I can recoup a little bit or more of the uh, money I've thrown at this um, and my time and effort. That would be nice. I think there's potential. And as I say, if you're, if you're making, if you're getting the best facial results, and I, with that, I think the best improvement in health in people, there's some money to be made there along the way. But that's secondary. That's secondary. When I first came down here, money didn't enter it. It was a passion to do the right thing, to move this forward. It, it's all consuming. When you find a passion, and you find a passion like I've got, it, it just consumes you. It does everything. It's important for me to make enough time for my family. Anyway, I'll keep... I, I wanted to do a, a blog like this to sort of remember just... A mark in the sand, a, a sort of recording of where I was at this moment in time. And I hope some people find this interesting, and I hope people enjoy this story, because it's very much it's a family story of, you know, it was uh, yeah, about 30, 40 years, 40 years at least, and my family has thrown everything it has to making the world a better place. My, my father doesn't expect anything from this. You know, he, He's run a charity for so long, he's put so much of his own personal money into this. You know, He makes good money in houses, we're basically in the 70s. And he's run a charity ever since, for the benefit of humanity. And everyone in our profession that I know has just thrown criticism and scorn and abuse at him and you know he's 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 he he's got the he's right he's correct the theories and philosophies has come out with a sound it's just been prevented from any engage there's no engagement his his concept you know the tropic premise has never ever had a full scientific review ever I mean, lots of little events where people said how terrible it is but based on what? Based on what evidence? I mean, you've got to actually be scientific about these things. Anyway, I will continue to make these posts once in a while. And it gives, it gives the viewer, the people who have been following us, a little bit of insight information as to what's been going on behind the scenes. All right, listen. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen.